Book Three, Chapter Twenty One of In Search of the Castaways. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. In Search of the Castaways or the Children of Captain Grant by Jules Verne. Book Three, Chapter Twenty One. Paganel's Last Entanglement. On the 19th of March, eleven days after leaving the island, the Duncan sighted the American coast, and next day dropped anchor in the bay of Talcahuano. They had come back again after a voyage of five months, during which, and keeping strictly along the 37th parallel, they had gone round the world. The passengers in this memorable expedition, unprecedented in the annals of the Travelers' Club, had visited Chile, the Pampas, the Argentine Republic, the Atlantic, the island of Tristan da Cunha, the Indian Ocean, Amsterdam Island, Australia, New Zealand, Isle Tabor, and the Pacific. Their search had not been fruitless, for they were bringing back the survivors of the shipwrecked Britannia. No one of the brave Scots who set out as the summons of their chief, but could answer to their names. All were returning to their old Scotia. As soon as the Duncan had reprovisioned, he, she sailed along the coast of Patagonia, doubled Cape Horn, and made a swift run up the Atlantic Ocean. No voyage could be more devoid of incident. The yacht was simply carrying home a cargo of happiness. There was no secret now on board, not even John Mangles' attachment to Mary Grant. Yes, there was one mystery still, which greatly excited McNabb's curiosity. Why was it that Paganel remained always hermetically fastened up in his clothes, with a big comfort around his throat, and up to his very ears? The Major was burning with desire to know the reason of this singular fashion. But in spite of interrogations, allusions, and suspicions on the part of McNabb's, Paganel would not unbutton. Not even when the Duncan crossed the line, and the heat was so great that the seams of the deck were melting. "'He is so distraught that he thinks he is at St. Petersburg,' said the Major, when he saw the geographer wrapped in an immense greatcoat, as if the mercury had been frozen in the thermometer. At last, on the ninth of May, fifty-three days from the time of leaving Tocahuano, John Mangles sighted the lights of Cape Clear. The yacht entered St. George's Channel, crossed the Irish Sea, and on the 10th of May reached the Firth of Clyde. At eleven o'clock she dropped anchor off Dunbarton, and at 2 p.m. the passengers arrived at Malcolm Castle amid the enthusiastic cheering of the Highlanders. As fate would have it, then, Harry Grant and his two companions were saved. John Mangles wedded Mary Grant in the old cathedral of St. Mungo, and Mr. Paxton, the same clergyman who had prayed nine months before for the deliverance of the father, now blessed the marriage of his daughter and his deliverer. Robert was to become a sailor like Harry Grant and John Mangles, and take part with them in the captain's grand projects, under the auspices of Lord Glenarvan. But fate also decreed that Paganel was not to die a bachelor. Probably so. The fact was, the learned geographer, after his heroic exploits, could not escape celebrity. His blunders made quite a furor among the fashionables of Scotland, and he was overwhelmed with courtesies. It was then that an amiable lady, about thirty years of age, in fact, a cousin of McNabb's, a little eccentric herself, but good and still charming, fell in love with the geographer's oddities, and offered him her hand. Forty thousand pounds went with it, but that was not mentioned. Paganel was far from being insensible to the sentiments of Miss Arabella, but yet he did not dare to speak. It was the Major who was the medium of communication between these two souls, evidently made for each other. He even told Paganel that his marriage was the last freak he would be able to allow himself. Paganel was in a great state of embarrassment, but strangely enough could not make up his mind to speak the fatal word. "'Does not Miss Arabella please you, then?' asked McNabbs. 
"'Oh, Major, she is charming!' exclaimed Paganel. "'A thousand times too charming! "'And if I must tell you all, she would please me better if she were less so. "'I wish she had a defect.' "'Be easy on that score,' replied the Major. "'She has, and more than one. "'The most perfect woman in the world has always her quota. "'So, Paganel, it is settled then, I suppose.' "'I dare not. "'Come now, my learned friend.' "'What makes you hesitate?' "'I am unworthy of Miss Arabella,' was the invariable reply of the geographer, and to this he would stick. At last, one day, being fairly driven in a corner by the intractable major, he ended by confiding to him, under the seal of secrecy, a certain peculiarity which would facilitate his apprehension should the police ever be on his track. "'Bah!' said the major." "'It is really as I tell you,' replied Paganel. "'What does it matter, my worthy friend?' "'Do you think so, Major? "'It only makes you more uncommon. "'It adds to your personal merits. "'It is the very thing to make you the non-parallel husband that Arabella dreams about.' "'And the Major, with imperturbable gravity, left Paganel in a state of the utmost disquietude.' A short conversation ensured between McNabbs and Miss Arabella. A fortnight afterwards, the marriage was celebrated in grand style in the chapel of Malcolm Castle. Paganel looked magnificent, but closely buttoned up, and Miss Arabella was arrayed in splendor. And this secret of the geographer would have been forever buried in oblivion if the Major had not mentioned it to Glenarvan, and he could not hide it from Lady Helena, who gave a hint to Mrs. Mangles. To make a long story short, it got in the end to Mr. Albinet's ears, and soon came noised abroad. Jack Spaganel, during his three days' captivity among the Maoris, had been tattooed from the feet to the shoulders, and he bore on his chest a heraldic kiwi with outspread wings, which was biting at his heart. This was the only adventure of his grand voyage that Paganel could never get over, and he always bore a grudge to New Zealand on account of it. It was for this reason, too, that, notwithstanding solicitation and regrets, he never would return to France. He dreaded, lest he should expose the whole geographical society in his person to the jests of caricaturists and low newspapers by their secretary coming back tattooed. The return of the captain to Scotland was a national event, and Harry Grant was soon the most popular man in old Caledonia. His son, Robert, became a sailor like himself, and Captain Mangles, and under the patronage of Lord Glenarvan, they resumed the project of founding a Scotch colony in the southern seas. End of Book 3, Chapter 21 And This is also the end of in Search of the Castaways by Jules Verne.